Marsha for encouraging me to invite a student, and thank you, Sophie, for agreeing to join me today. Um, so we're going to talk about a project on professionals' identities in advertising and then how that shapes their experiences. Um, the series Mad Men was really not that far off when it comes to professional identities in advertising. Um, the industry is really not friendly to uh, a lot of different groups of people. And so as we look across the trade press, we can see um, that advertising has an ageism problem um, in which uh, older employees are kind of pushed out of the organization. It has problems with uh, race and ethnicity, um, underrepresentation of black and Hispanic uh, people, especially uh, within the industry. As we look at women, especially within the creative department and within leadership positions, they are uh, underrepresented there. And LGBTQ identified people um, are so ignored, I guess, by the industry that we don't even have, I, I couldn't even find an article that addressed this community. Um, so this is like someone's blog post where they kind of mentioned it. Um, and so we definitely have a lack of representation there. And representation really does matter because advertising people are cultural intermediaries. So uh, in their roles, they are creating things that go out to the media. Um, and then those things can have an influence on people in society. Um, and so we can see some of the potential downsides of the ageism in the industry because consumers over 50 perceive a marketing bias against them. Um, when we think about race and ethnicity, we see that actors of color appeared in ads less often this year, that was 2022, than the year before it. Um, if we're thinking about women, uh, women in advertising are humorless, mute, and in the kitchen. Um, so we obviously have some representation problems there. Um, and then after years of g gains, LGBTQ community was missing from the most recent Super Bowl ads. Um, so that representation does matter. So in the spring of 2020, I applied for a faculty research summer award. Um, I was going to travel to New York and collect lots of data. Um, <laughs> something else happened in the spring of 2020 that prevented that. But I was able to Zoom and collect lots and lots of interview data with professionals. It started with very broad research questions. Um, how do advertising professionals' identities shape their treatment in the industry? How do they cope with challenges? How does it shape, how do their identities shape the ads that they produce and the way that they work in the industry? And so uh, we did in-depth interviews with 51 advertising professionals, and we were looking for the broadest range of people possible. We wanted various races, ethnicities, genders. We wanted LGBTQ people. We wanted juniors and seniors and older people. Um, and so as we gathered our data, we were trying to look for as diverse as possible a group. And so the shaded ones are the traditionally marginalized communities there. Um, for our participants, and so we're trying to seek out people from those marginalized communities. And our interview guide first started broadly about their work history and their job, and then we asked them to identify what are two identities you have that have been salient in your experience in the industry. Um, and then after they identified that, for each of those identities, we would dig in deeper to learn about that identity. So how has that identity shaped your life experiences, your work experiences, what challenges have you faced, your coping strategies, um, how does it shape your interactions with friends, the work you produce, and then if you had a magic wand to fix it, what would you do? Um, and because we asked about two different identities, um, we got to like dive in deep. So each of these 51 participants talked about two identities. So that means that could inform two different papers, which when you understand how slowly qualitative research works and how hard it is to collect data, um, gathering it in a way that allows you to, to um, inform multiple papers and studies is a really good tip. 
So we have developed seven papers so far um, on this, and so we've developed papers on gender, on ageism, on race and ethnicity, and on LGBTQ identities. Um, if you'll see the highlighted or the bolded people, these are all our CJC grad students. So, yay, CJC, all our grad students. Uh, thank you all for all partnering with me on this. And today we're going to talk, because it's International Women's Month, about the papers on gender and on LGBTQ identities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sophie. Hi everyone, and I'm so happy that you all could make it here today to talk about one of my favorite topics to talk about, and that is gender and advertising. So our first study that was published in the Journal of Gender Studies is entitled From Below the Glass Ceiling, Female Perspectives in the World of Advertising. Oh, sorry. Why? That's me. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of piggybacking off of what Dr. Mundell's mentioned in regards to the Mad Men TV show in 2021, strategist and entrepreneur Zoe Scamon published an article entitled Mad Men Purest Women, which outlined the rampant sexism that has permeated the industry and its subsequent impact on women's mental health as well as their careers. So she said, hey, women are sexually and verbally abused in the workplace, and the ad industry actually still leads the way in gender pay gaps. Interestingly, in a separate study, full of half, fully half of the qualified female talent in the industry is lost between graduating with an advertising degree and solidifying a position in the ad agency, particularly within the creative department. And if we look at the research that is published in journals, we know that there really is an apparent lack of women being creative. Current research does show that they only account for about a quarter of positions in creative departments. Of course, they make up 50% of the population, so they are outnumbered by men in creative. In these uh, studies, we also find that gender is perceived as a barrier to climbing up the ranks in creative departments. While there's been a plethora of research, obviously, on these creative departments, there has been little research conducted on advertising agencies as a whole. We could only really find four studies, and these came from England, Greece, Peru, and Spain. So we kind of wanted to understand a broad agency, broad industry perspective, a full agency understanding of these professional women. And in order to do that, we utilized two theoretical approaches, the top-down approach via the status characteristics theory that helped us understand the behaviors of leaders, and then a bottom-up approach via the conservation of resource theory, which helped us understand the perspectives of employees. So from the SCT, or the status characteristics theory, we know that socially significant characteristics and identity create and shape work environments and hierarchies within these work environments. The theory states there, that there are several characteristics that are valued more than others, like power, status, and competence. And unfortunately, in these task-related group organizations and settings, we know that there are perceived gender role expectations, which, mean that, which means that men are seen as having more power, status, and confidence than women. And because superiors reward those who engage in gender normative behaviors, both men and women in these task-oriented group settings will prescribe and act out these social norms. So that leads us to our first research question of does the structure and culture of the, agency, of the advertising agency environment foster or inhibit the acquisition of resources by women? We then use the conservation of resources theory for core, and we know that employees are motivated to acquire new resources as well as retain and protect their existing resources. And what are resources? It's really anything that will help you succeed in the workplace environment and, of course, thwart off any threats. And coupled with SCT, because we know that women will behave according to gender roles and norms to gain access to resources, we ask our second research question. 
do gender identity and gender characteristics influence how women behave and are rewarded in ad agencies? From the core perspective, we also know we have to invest in existing resources in order to gain more resources. So those with a surplus of resources are at an advantage, i.e. men, as they have increased opportunities that will reward them and with future and further resources. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I mean, women don't have as many resources as men. So that, from the outset, is a problem for women. We also know from poor that there is a thing called loss spirals, which occurs when there are too many resources that have been expended and the individual is unable to cope with future loss threats, leading to even more and more losses, which led us to our third research question, what happens when an advertising woman is caught in a loss spiral? So as Dr. Wendell's pointed out, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so as Dr. Mandel pointed out, we collected all of this lovely data, we analyzed a subset of that data that did pertain to just women in the industry, and we found four our overarching themes. And the first theme is boys will be boys. Uh, there were two words that almost every single interview you said that categorized the industry as a whole, and that was the boys club. You might ask yourself, well, what is the boys club? Well, it's the way men interact with one another in the advertising industry as they abide by that bro culture. That bro culture includes the uh, banter that men engage in at the expense of women. So for an example, one woman recounted that she and her colleague entered the meeting room with a number of other men. There were no more chairs left to sit on. So of course, one of the directors looked at the two women and said, you don't need a chair. You can just sit on my lap. Women also spoke of contending with nepotism and indicated that they were less likely to be heard, supported, and acknowledged. And some men took that notion of the boys' club membership way, way too far in the uh, sexually inappropriate behaviors that they engaged in. One interviewee even indicated that women in the industry had a mental Rolodex of the chief perpetrators of in inappropriate behaviors so that they knew automatically who to stay away from. Our second theme was it's a girl's job. Within the agency, there are jobs that are prescribed to men and to women. For men, these jobs are typically in creative and leadership positions because they are a men's domain. Women who do make it into those creative departments are typically in lower ranking positions like art directors and below. And if a woman does step into a truly traditionally male-oriented position, like a higher position in the firm, she does receive backlash, particularly from clients. And one girl's job that was clearly identified as a glaring negative in advertising agents was being a mother. Children are viewed as baggage in advertising agency, which interestingly enough was not a concept attributed to men. Our third, wrong, third, our third theme is Barbie girls in an advertising world, and this really had to do with all of the things that women had to do to the exterior of their bodies in order to be and stay attractive. So women bought themselves new wardrobes, they used makeup, they put their bodies through plastic surgery, all to stay and look young. And that's because it was believed that those who were more attractive had more opportunities presented to them, and there was, of course, more of an importance placed on appearances as women age, because naturally, women are super unattractive as they grow older. Um, but that outward uh, appearance fixation was draining to appear to, to participants. At some point, they really didn't want to keep up with the Jones anymore. One participant said, there comes a time when women say to themselves, this is too exhausting, I just have to be it myself. And our last theme is the step work for wives of the agency, and this has to do with the internal changes that women had to make. Specifically, uh, women had to mold and change the way that they behaved in order to thrive in industry. For example, several women spoke of the self-imposed restrictions on their speech, including not only what they said, but also how they said it. 
So we can go ahead and apply our themes as well as our theories in order to answer our research question. Our first research question pertains to the effect of the structure and culture of the agency on women's resources, and that can be answered through our first two themes. From SCT, we know that male bosses reward other males because they are seen as possessing certain favorable characteristics, which then in turn leads to the development of the boys' club, where men continue to rise to the top, and women are very much left behind. Gender normative expectations come into play when entering into the boys club for both men and women, as men engage in that derogatory language and inappropriate behaviors to fit in and earn their approval and respect of their male superiors in order to gain additional rewards. Those women who do appear in traditionally male-oriented roles get backlash from the firm as well as from clients. From this theme, we find that women are viewed stereotypically with it from the, the it's a girl's job theme. We know that women are viewed stereotypically within the advertising industry, which directly impacts their success in the agency. Further, when a woman becomes a mother, that becomes her salient descriptor, which downwardly biases the evaluations of the worker's job, worker's job competence, and suitability for positions of authority, which also could be why mothers are seen as having baggage children and are less likely to return to positions that they know that they're not going to grow in once they finish maternity leave. The third and fourth themes can help us answer our second research question, which asks whether gender identity and gender characteristics influence how women were perceived and behaved in advertising. From the perspective of four, we know that younger women will have more resources because beauty is rewarded. From SCT, we saw that women align themselves with those gender normative expectations because they wanted to gain rewards and opportunities to try and get to the level of their male colleagues. And again, based on four, women also gave up their own voices to acquire those desired resources. That was because responding to superiors with gender normative behaviors increased access to resources while responding with gender counter normative behaviors resulted in punishment. Actually, one respondent noticed that, noted that being authoritative, which was of course a masculine trait as a woman, would reward you with the title of quote unquote bitch. So women who behave in a male oriented fashion really were punished by their colleagues. And finally, to answer our research question three, we applied four throughout the four themes. Um, and our last research question did pertain to the locks of spirals of course. Um, starting with the boys club, we saw that women were just from the offset, not given the same opportunities as men. And based on the last two themes, we saw that as women aged in the industry, they experienced exhaustion in trying to keep up with their image that is expected in the firm. Women who at some point no longer want to contort their bodies and behaviors to align with these unrealistic beauty and gender standards, of course, become increasingly susceptible to falling into a lost spiral. Their already reduced resources dwindle, and they can no longer invest these as easily as men and young women. And that inability to uphold beauty and behavior standards ultimately leads to burnout, and unfortunately, their exit from the industry altogether. So that wraps up our first study that we conducted. I will pass the baton back to Dr. Wendells to talk about our first LGBTQ plus study. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so yeah, uh, this paper, From Surviving to Thriving at Ad Agencies, the Lived Experiences of LGBTQ Identified Practitioners, is going to be presented at the American Academy of Advertising Conference next week in Denver. So I got to jump on my presentation for the first time in history, yay. Um, so as we think about LGBTQ representation in advertising, most or all of the emphasis so far has been on the campaigns. Are we putting LGBTQ people in our ads and representing them in fair ways? Um, so we could see a couple of stories here that are both about that. And when we think about the research um, that's done in advertising on LGBTQ populations or uh, identities, it also is about representations or about how people, consumers, respond to representations. Um, there have been no studies, none, zero, on what it's like to be LGBTQ in advertising. As you 
work within the industry. And that, of course, is an increasingly important thing for the industry to figure out. Recent Gallup poll found that identification had ticked up to 7.1%. Um, and then in looking at the generational gap, you can see for Generation Z, 20.8% identified as LGBTQ. Um, so that's a, a, a big population that is coming very soon for the advertising industry, um, which is a very young industry uh, overall. And even among DEI reports, so you know, these are two different organizations, the AMA and the AAA, four A's, um, that are professional organizations for advertising. And so when they report on DEI issues, uh, they report a lot about race and ethnicity, a lot about gender, but even they, responsible for DEI, are overlooking or under, you know, not paying enough attention to um, sexual orientation and sexual identities. Two kind of terms that are helping to guide this research based on the findings are ideas about assimilation. Um, and so we saw lots of assimilation in which uh, LGBTQ people tried to conform to agency norms, to existing norms. Um, and in order to do that, they had to give up pieces of themselves and give up parts of their own individuality. Um, and we also saw themes of heteronormativity in which heterosexuality is the norm um, and anything else is seen as deviant or lesser than. Um, and so, uh, you know, that shaped how people saw their experiences in the industry. And so we're building from three research questions here, thinking about how uh, identifying as a member of the LGBTQ community affects their experiences working in the industry, what strategies they use to navigate, and then whether their strategies changed over time from when they entered the industry until later in their careers. Um, this is built on 10 of the interviews. We do have several more to add to this based on our last round of data collection. Um, so the first theme was a huge pressure to assimilate. This feeling like um, I don't want to be uncool. And so I'm just going to try to fit in and blend in as much as possible within this industry or agency. So this person said, remember, I wanted to be a cool person. I didn't want to be someone who was going to be outspoken or push against things like that. And another person said, if you feel like it's the only way, like if you don't do it, you're going to be uncool and stick in the mud. Um, and so these were people who were talking about, should I stand up when I hear instances of discrimination? Should I fight for members of the LGBTQ community? And they were saying they felt a hesitancy uh, to do that. People who started in the industry in the early 2000s were really interesting to listen to. So this one woman made up a boyfriend. She had an entire fake boyfriend. Um, she said she had heard people use derogatory terms about gay people and lesbians, so I never told anyone. Even though I lived with my partner, I had a fake relationship with a guy in order to deter people. She would talk about random dates that she had with her fake boyfriend as a decoy because I didn't want anyone to ever know because I thought it would affect my career. And so this idea that she is not only trying to blend in but actively you know, lying to say, please don't hurt my career um, because I'm a gay woman. There was... Um, among people who said they wanted to speak up, I want to point out that we haven't used any LGBTQ people in advertising. Um, there's a fear that it's going to be seen as self-serving. And so this woman said, I feel like they're going to be like, well, she's just saying it because she's a gay woman. And so this idea that um, it's self-serving to fight for this community and therefore should I do it or will it be received well if I do it. There was a hesitant, in that hesitancy to bring your whole self to work, um, this one gay man who was an account manager. So his job is to engage with clients and to get to know them and to schmooze them and to take them out. 
Um, and so he said with his female clients, he could tell them he was gay and they would talk about his boyfriend and they would have a good time about it. And so he developed this really great relationship with them. But for his male clients, he felt less comfortable doing that. So he hid that part of, that, of his identity. And then that caused him to not feel like that relationship was strong um, because of not revealing that. And then a really big deal was this idea that LGBTQ perspectives are not sought out. So while we might say, oh, what's the woman's perspective on this? Or, oh, um, you know, we want to hear what the people of color in the room think about this ad. Um, in this perspective, people said, I wouldn't say that people listened to or wanted to know my lesbian perspective. I don't think anyone cared about that. Or that's not what clients and agencies are looking for. No one is looking for a gay perspective or an LGBTQ perspective. Um, so that's a really big kind of blind spot that the agency uh, industry has. But there were, in that idea of how your career started versus what happens later in your career, a lot of people talked about having like a moment of enlightenment or a moment where like blending in and hiding just wasn't working anymore and they needed to start, it, start being a much more proactive. Um, and so this one woman was talking about a video series she was doing for uh, Pride. And so she was uh, interviewing on video all of these people in the agency and she was talking to this man who was from New York City so he had an apartment with one TV when he was growing up. And she asked him, you know, tell me about the first time you saw a gay person on TV and how did that make you feel? Um, and he was like, are you kidding me? There is no way I could have been watching something with gay people in it. Like anybody who walked in the room would have been like, what the hell are you doing? Um, and so for her, she said, oh my goodness, he couldn't watch something like RuPaul's Drag Race, but he could have seen gay people in ads, right? If, if there were better representation of gay people in ads, he could have seen that and he could have like felt more included. And so for her, that was a reason to fight for more representation within advertising. Um, <laughs> several people talked about being so pumped when they saw LGBTQ people in ads. Um, so this woman said she saw an ad for frozen fries and one of the families was a gay couple couple and we're still talking about that stupid ad like for god's sakes they sell fries they're not saving the world um and so this idea that seeing that getting excited about it made them say to themselves you know what i need to be fighting for more of that in advertising and as they did that they started to engage in more proactive be behaviors like hiring more diverse teams um, ensuring that they gave everyone on their team a fair shot uh, at having really great ads to work on and getting their ideas through, um, and just encouraging everyone within a conference room to be able to voice their opinions. And so overall we found that there was great pressure to conform, um, which caused people to compromise parts of themselves within the advertising industry. Um, and they would perform heteronormativity so that they could survive and so that they could thrive and get promoted um, in the industry. Um, and so because they felt they couldn't bring their whole selves to work, their relationships with clients suffered, the work they created suffered, their own creativity suffered. Um, but as people started to feel more accepted uh, within the industry as, they, as uh, these identities became more accepted, especially in the last few years, um, they felt more comfortable and spoke up more. Um, so Kaplan in 2022 said, treat queer difference as human capital. And we haven't really seen the industry do that yet, um, but that's something that they need to do is start saying, we value you for your opinion, for who you are, um, because all of the perspectives are going to make better at. With that, I'll turn it over to Sophie for our third paper. Uh, so we actually have officially submitted this paper to AEJ and CBS for a head of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and this paper is entitled, All Orientations Are Not Treated Equally, a fair treat with LGBTQ plus advertising agency employees. 
So we know from current research that there's actually an increase in LGBTQ plus representation in advertising, which is great. Consumers are seeing more LGBTQ plus individuals in ads. 93% of consumers have actually said that they recall seeing an ad which portrayed an LGBTQ plus character. But when we look at how LGBTQ plus consumers are seeing these ads, well, they don't really necessarily feel represented or accurately represented in these commercial communications. So it seems to be there's a discrepancy between what's going on in the ad agency and the commercial communications that they produce. So we want to take a little bit of a closer look at how these individuals are treated in advertising agencies. And unfortunately, there's virtually no research out there. Uh, as Dr. Wendell has noted, on LGBT plus experiences in the advertising industry. There's only one industry study that was conducted by the Visibility Project that more or less found that the majority of agency employees, whether at the CEO or at the uh, executive level, um, said that their firms really weren't very accepting and inclusive of all communities. So we really wanted to develop that better understanding of the lived experiences of different LGBTQ plus individuals in agencies across the nation. And we decided to use queer social theory to look at this data. And this theory seeks to understand the performance of sex sexuality and the segregation, oppression, and constraints that are placed on certain groups based on their sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. One term that is really concerned, that queer social theory is really concerned with is that of gender heteronormativity. Now here we stumble over heteronormativity for the next 10 minutes. Gender heteronormativity is defined as the persistence of heterosexual sexuality as the norm, which is linked to constructions of gender and desire, rendering them normative or norm, non-normative. What does that mean? The white heterosexual male is seen as the norm, everyone else is evidently abnormal. And given that gender heteronormativity is prevalent throughout our daily lives, we also assume that it's going to creep up in the workplace. And research shows that it does at three different levels, at the organizational level, at the interpersonal level, and at the individual level as well. At the organizational level, we see gender heteronormativity through informal and formal practices and policies, including monitoring and physical condition, i.e. toilets that are might be gender or non-gender inclusive. At the interpersonal level, we see it through discourses and behaviors and the relationships that we form with other employees. And at the individual, we also see gender heteronormativity with our own behaviors and choices. So then the question is, do you really see gender heteronormativity at work? Of course we do. We see gender discrimination at work based not only off of current research, but also our own research as well. Sexism is unfortunately alive and well, and men are treated better than women, specifically in advertising agencies as well. We also find that people are treated differently based on their sexual orientation. While this is not a study that is specifically on the advertising industry, the UCLA School of Law's Williams Institute did survey 1,000 LGBTQ plus employees broadly, and they found that discrimination against these individuals is still persistent and widespread. Uh, more than half experienced discrimination at some point during their careers, and this form of discrimination for all LGBTQ plus employees is oftentimes at the informal level, with more than 50%, 67.5%, uh, in fact, reported being called or hearing the word training or dyke in the workplace. We also find that there is discrimination on the gender and sexual orientation front if we combine those nicely together. Uh, the uh, UCLA study did not look at LGBTQ plus individuals only as a homogenous group. They also differentiated between the different individuals that are under that umbrella term and found that transgender employees were more likely to experience formal discrimination relative to cisgender coworkers. We also see that gender and sexual orientation, unfortunately, work together to affect the experiences of LGBTQ plus women negatively. 
I was going to determine that LGBTQ plus women are largely underrepresented in firms. They also are more likely to experience microaggressions and more likely to feel a sense of loneliness or being the only member, feeling like you're the only member in a given group. So what does that mean for LGBTQ plus employees? Well, we see an increased use of covering, and covering was used to, present, to prevent discrimination, and it is used to prevent discrimination, and that includes making alterations to appearances and avoiding talking about your personal life. Transgender employees in particular are most likely to engage in covering relative to cisgender employees. So taken together, what is currently happening in the advertising industry, plus what we know about uh, uh, our theory at hand, specifically about gender heteronormativity, we asked our overarching research question, how do the experiences of LGBTQ plus advertising professionals differ based on their sex, sexual orientation, and gender identities? And we did come up with five themes. Uh, and these are our five themes that I'm going to go ahead and go over now. The first is that there are differences between gays and lesbians. So gender does make a difference. Homosexual men, or otherwise known as gays, said that their LGBTQ plus status actually helped them in their careers, and they were actually more likely to be able to climb the corporate ladder. On the other end of the spectrum, homosexual women or lesbians noted several difficulties due to their sexual orientation and gender. Lesbian women interviewed indicated that they were really underrepresented in agencies, not surprising given current research. Further, based on what was one of the interviewees said in particular and additional comments, lesbians are not treated quite like a woman and not treated quite like a dude. For example, a gender non-conforming lesbian was put on different accounts than female co-workers, but she also didn't really feel part of the boys club that she was kind of in, so she was left in this weird in-between place. Taken together, this led lesbians to indicate they didn't really feel like they had a sense of community. There were also differences found between homosexual employees and those who identified as non-binary, gender fluid, transgender, or queer. While, gen while gays and lesbians relatively felt relatively felt like they were understood, this was not the case for non-binary, gender fluid, transgender, and queer individuals. They also experienced increased barriers to positions higher up in the firm, and some individuals even position themselves differently in order to answer to advance their careers. And we can see that with our quote from uh, our participant 34. Um, they felt it's more risky to say queer or gender fluid than it was to say gay, uh, which was already accepted in the mainstream, so they just decided to say gay, even though they were non-binary, gender fluid, would and fear in their personal lives. There were also differences between participants that conformed to gendered standards and those who did not conform to gendered standards. And those who did fit those gendered molds were a lot of certain privileges. So for example, men would be friendlier to gender conforming lesbian women. But as soon as they learned about that individual's sexual orientation, their behavior swiftly changed. So we see that from one of our respondents, uh, number 31, and then suddenly he will like almost see through me, like the next day. And I'm like, oh, someone told him. You know what I mean? Like I'm not available for him. And I've had that experience where I just feel like I suddenly evaporate. Filling, uh, fitting into the boys club also meant that you not only had to walk that walk, but you had to talk that talk which is difficult for individuals who aren't old white men, let's be very honest. We have Respondent 35, a gay Mexican-American, who said, it's all about who you know, and if you like them, and if you play golf with them, and I didn't. Like, that's not who I am, that's not who I was, I didn't fit that mold, and so you didn't fit that mold, you didn't get into the club. The department that an LGBTQ plus employee worked in also made a difference. First, there were those who worked in accounts, where the employees generally worked directly with clients. 
Here we found that LGBTQ plus employees had difficulty building relationships with clients as they felt that they really couldn't bring their whole selves to the table. Uh, participant three said that one particular client would be like, let's go to a strip club. And the agency knows that I'm gay, but he doesn't know that I'm gay. I'm gay. And I don't necessarily know if I want to tell them that I'm gay, but now he wants to go to a strip club and this should be interesting. He went on to speak about wanting to make the client feel comfortable more than make even himself feel comfortable. But that lack of transparency with clients could even hurt the relationship. Participant three, for example, said that certain people that just don't get a chance to know who I was led him to bifurcate between his strategist self and himself as an actual person. In turn, that could also impact the relationship between the agency and the client. As a strong relationship was not only built on the employee and the client, the employee also uh, indicated that they often did not go that extra mile for those clients that they didn't feel comfortable interacting with and telling them about their identities. However, in the creative department, if we head over to our lovely creative department that is so sexist, uh, we find that LGBT employees didn't really have to deal with clients. For example, participant 31 said, I've never really gotten to the level of being, being like friends with a client. I don't even ever think I've been in that situation. But these employees spoke in greater depth about not finding the community. Per R10, I still felt very like an other, even though I thought it was going to be a more accepting place. Unsurprisingly, once we make it to the very top, things start to look a bit different. So those lucky few who did obtain CC positions, and these were positions typically in their own advertising or marketing firms, could identify key differences from being at the very bottom to being at the very top. And they were also more likely to say and speak out when a, a discriminatory act was engaged in. Finally, there were differences in treatment across LGBTQ individuals over the past three decades. And we saw this a little bit in uh, study one. Older participants who started their careers in 2000 noted that they were coming out just when being LGBTQ plus was kind of being accepted. This lack of acceptance, generally speaking, was also present in the firm that they worked for as the advertising industry in the early 2000s Per the respondents was dubbed as old school of boys club and not very progressive. Per participant 28, uh, as uh, Dr. Wendell said before, even though I lived with my partner, I would fake a relationship with a guy in order to deter people. Um, she was also told that uh, saying that she was a gay woman was actually career suicide because of the stereotypes that were rampant in 2000 around what it meant to be a gay woman. R5, also an older participant, felt like she went through it when she really wasn't set up for success. You had to battle for it a little bit. You had to fight a little bit. It was not a great time. This is, of course, in very stark contrast to LGBTQ plus employees today. From, from younger participants, there was generally positive statements about their treatment in the industry. For example, one participant said, I see a lot of respect and patience with my team. So that definitely is something I take notice of. Notice of. I, I feel like I'm in a safe place and I have room to talk and grow. Another participant stated that the ad industry really embraces having people from different backgrounds. And yet a third said people appreciate and like this aspect, specifically their LGBTQ plus identity about their personality and their identity. So we can go ahead and apply the theory of gender heteronormativity to the themes that we found. Echoing gender heteronormativity, the lesbian agency experiences are permeated with sexism and gender role oppression more than their gay men counterparts because of their multiple marginalized identities. While they are both homosexual, their lived experiences are very different because of their gender. Specifically, as we saw, white gay men are placed in more powerful positions, while lesbians are few and far between. 
Similarly, there was a clear lack of bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals in advertising agencies, and without representation, cisgender, heterosexual agency workers, leaders, and clients have no in-person contact with bisexual, transgender, and queer folks, and consequently have no relevant language and literacy to understand what bisexual, transgender, and queer identities entail, which also means they don't really know how to act and behave around them, and that just leads to very uncomfortable situations and the isolation of those bisexual, queer, and transgender as uh, transgender individuals. So bisexual, transgender, and queer employees actually resolve to present themselves as being gay or lesbian in order to fit into the industry. So they're not really bringing their whole selves to work. So these covering strategies are another form of passing where bisexual minorities perform binary gender and gender norm, gender roles, uh, to pass as heterosexual, to seek acceptance from the workplace and from their co-workers. In order to tackle these issues, of course, we must hire and promote more LGBTQ plus uh, employees, and we have to start working on how we treat these LGBTQ plus employees in the firm. But we also have to recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach to tackling this issue in firms doesn't really work because there are different uh, nuances and different traumas across generations, across departments. Um, so we need to really de start developing these uh, specific remedies for certain agencies, for certain departments, and for certain individuals. And so what's next for our project? We are going to, we have a paper on intersectionality that is just that, paper on intersectionality, write one, um, that <laughs> needs to happen. Um, and we have all of these conference papers that we need to get submitted to journals.